Hi, this is Steve, blessedhopeforever.com. We're going through Galatians verse by verse. In our last study together, we had reached the 25th verse of chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. The uh, epistle to the Galatians is the Holy Spirit's remarkable historic treatise on the subject of law and grace. What had happened at Galatia is what has happened in every Christian community, and that is the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Well, it's a beginning, but there's something that the human must do. In the particular case of Galatia, it was circumcision. And the request or the demand for circumcision came from those who had been skilled, uh, trained in Jewish law. And what they said was, basically, what they said was, well, it's well and good what Jesus Christ has done. And we believe that you can be, and, and I'll, I'll use the word saved, uh, we believe that that you can be saved, but you must be circumcised. And that type of humanism, dearly beloved, has plagued the Christian community ever since Jesus Christ ascended back to the Father. It shows itself in many forms. Circumcision was the case there at Galatia. But in no way should we limit the idea just to circumcision. There's not many Christians running around today circumcising themselves. To be Galatianized is to say that one must do something to become a Christian. Period. Period. That's the heart of the issue. It, making something, anything, a requirement for redemption was the Galatian error. We would not have an epistle to the Galatians if that were not true, I don't think. But somehow or other, we collectively, all of us, uh, Christianity as a whole has become totally confused about the idea of believing Dearly beloved, listen, your believing, contrary to popular myth, has nothing to do with the, the gospel, the good news. And I believe it is supremely important that we understand the thesis of this book, Galatians. Take time to study this book. That's the way it began. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And the Holy Spirit emphasizes that by repeating it. As I said before, so say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that that you have received, let him be accursed. That is strong language. The only other place that you would find any indication of that is in 1 Corinthians. If you love not the if anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. No passage of scripture says, you know, if you don't go to this or that church, let him be accursed. There's no other passage of Scripture that says if you don't do this or, or don't do that, let him be accursed. What was the gospel preached to the Galatian believers? Well, Jesus Christ died in your place. That's good news. You don't tell somebody to believe. They either believe or they don't. 
the good news, the gospel, the grand news, the wonderful good news is not, hey, you can go to heaven if you want to. You know, here's what you got to do. That's humanism. That's humanism. The good news of the gospel, don't pervert it. The good news of the gospel is Jesus Christ died in your place and you're a new creation in Him. If you believe that, you'll act on it. If you don't believe it, you won't. But it doesn't make any difference. The good news or bad news is not whether or not you believe. The good news is Jesus Christ died in your place. How often do you hear that preached? Virtually never. And yet I have a verse of Scripture that says, if any man bring any other gospel, let him be accursed. Look at the statements of the gospel in the Word of God. Just read it at face value. For I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, how that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day from the dead. Notice it says, according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. makes no difference whether you believe it or not. If Jesus Christ, dearly beloved, if Jesus Christ died in your place, there was a period of time in your life where you didn't believe Him concerning that fact. Yet, nevertheless, you were redeemed. Don't you understand that? If a man is not a thief, would he ever steal? You know, some people answer immediately and some people, you know, they kind of scratch their head. But virtually everybody says no. You know, I think about it. If he really is not a thief, he'd never steal. And they're then, they're then tacitly admitting to me that the reason a man steals is because he's already a thief. You know, and we think about that you know, for just a tiny little bit. I haven't had any problem with that. Maybe you have a problem with that. I personally I don't have a, a problem with that. If you told me this man is absolutely not a thief, then he'll never steal. The only reason he'd ever steal is he's a thief. Then I ask the next question. Is it possible in your mind that a man is a thief? That means if he is a thief, he can steal. Is it possible in your mind that a man could be a thief and yet never steal? You know, I don't know maybe he died at, at an early age. I, I don't know, but, but he was a thief and he never stole. And people will scratch their head. Now, I don't get universal agreement, but I do get a lot of people that say, well, Steve, yeah, I guess. I, I mean, uh, 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 we're building a straw man, man here, but I guess it's possible that a person could be a thief and live his whole life never having stolen anything. 
It, it, it may be darn remote, but the reason he stole is he's a thief. Are you willing to agree that the reason a man believes is because he's a believer? And now I get all kinds of objections. We make, folks, we make people believers by humanism. You know, they initiated the process. They did it. I'm telling you that the Word of God says a person believes because he's a believer. And then I always, uh, you know, throw out the question, well, do you think, do you think it's possible that a person could be a believer and live his whole life and never believe? Folks, I do. Oh, I do. I think there'll be a great number, which you can't count, of people redeemed who never believed in our sense of the use of the word so that there will be those there before the throne from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. There was a time in your life where you were a believer and you didn't believe. I hope you're following this. Folks, the good news doesn't depend on you. The good news is based entirely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. The reason the Holy Spirit uses such strong language, you know, in verses uh, 6 through 8 of chapter 1, let him be accursed, is because perverting the gospel of Christ is perverting the person of Jesus Christ. This book, I've said it, I don't, I, so many times. This book is not a revelation of what you ought to do. It is primarily a revelation of what Jesus Christ did so that He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I've been eight years nearly, I guess, on this channel trying to get the point across to folks that by the disobedience of the one, Adam, the many were made sinners, in the same way by the obedience of the one, that is Jesus Christ, the many are made righteous. There's no belief in there. Folks, there's no belief on, on your part there. There's no receiving. There's no accepting or anything else. It is a simple statement of what God did in Jesus Christ. And yet, humans by the millions will blame God for having His own family. Unbelievable. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. When he saith to Abraham's seed, he didn't say seeds as of many, but it was of one to thy seed, which is Christ. Dearly beloved, bear in mind, the word seed is normally plural. And, and it's an exception in the Hebrew. When it occurs in the singular, and it, had, it occurred in the singular when God spoke to Abraham. And yet, in our present study, you know, we, we saw in chapter 3, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, singular in the Greek, heirs, heirs according to the promise. Oh, folks, I have great news for you. I have grand news for you. I have good news for you. 
Jesus Christ died in your place so that you can't die. All through the Bible, all through your Bible, all through the Word of God, you see these things and people ignore them. People ignore them. Verse after verse after verse and they just discard it as if it's... He by one offering has perfected forever those whom He's setting apart. Doesn't say, doesn't say those who believe, receive, accept, or baptize, uh, circumcised, uh, uh, those whom he's setting apart. Now those who, whom he's setting apart, therefore having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath by him. By him. Having been reconciled by the death of Christ, we shall be saved by his life. His life. We're saved by His life. I, I've asked the question, I, I don't know, I, so many times. You know, how, how are you saved? Oh, oh, by the death of Christ. Well, give, me, give me a verse. Give me a verse. I only want one, and you can't find it, but I can quote a verse where you are saved by the life of Christ. Those who are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in their place can receive it and accept it. You know, I quoted from 1 Corinthians. I've delivered unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and in, and in which you stand, and in which you are saved, Saved, if you keep in mind what I told you. Dearly beloved, I just want to say to all, uh, all ten of you, uh, ten of, uh, of my subscribers out there, the saving comes long after death, burial, and resurrection. You, you do understand that, right? I, and that's been the thrust of this entire epistle. It is too easy, far too easy to revert to law. You know, I, I try to tell people everywhere I go, you are not redeemed by anything you do, not believing, receiving, acceptance, baptism, judgment, nothing, nothing. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ paid the price. And that's good news. That's fabulous news. When you look at, uh, at what the flesh can do, it becomes apparent that the flesh cannot be synergistically involved in redemption. <laughs> For the works of the flesh are manifest. We, we, we looked at that. And the Holy Spirit gives them to us in our present context, none of them any good. None of them. But the thrust of that revelation is that they are in the area of law, but the fruit of the Spirit, praise God, that which takes time and grows is love, joy, peace, and so forth. Against such there is no law. And we shouldn't miss the fact that the differentiation has been made in our present context between that which is law, flesh, and the spirit. The, the, the flesh operates in the domain of law. The spirit, on the other hand, operates in the domain of grace. The Spirit operates in the domain of grace. The flesh operates in the sphere of law. 
They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and, it, and its lusts. That's, that's a statement of fact. Okay? I pointed out to you that you died with Christ. You were buried with Christ and you were raised with Christ. Not by anything you did. <clears throat> you know, when Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ said, you, Nicodemus, you must be born from above or born again, have, whichever way you, you take it. You know, he basically said, you know, are you, a, are you a, a teacher, a master in Israel and you don't know this? Why would Christ say that to Nicodemus? Are you a teacher in Israel and, and you don't know? What do you teach? You know, how many illustrations do you want? Abraham and Sarah. Dearly beloved, Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a kid. The only way that they had Isaac was by God's grace. Not by anything Abraham did. Not by anything Sarah did. This really happened. It, historically. That illustrates total depravity. Abraham was dead in his body. Sarah was dead in the womb. There was nothing Sarah could do. Nothing Abraham could do. And they had a child named Isaac. Totally depraved. You are children, dearly beloved, you are children of promise. Good land, Nicodemus. Have you considered the firstborn son in captivity in Egypt? He's going to die. I, 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 don't, I don't know how old the kid might have been. He, he goes to his dad, you know, I, you know, I'm going to die. Moses said, you know, it was going to be dark. You know, it was dark. Moses said the water, you know, was going to turn to blood. Turn to blood. Moses said that they're, 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 there's going to be frogs on the land. And there's frogs on the land. Moses, he said, I'm going to die. And the father says, you know, look, now I went to Harvard. Okay, Moses never went to Harvard. I went to Harvard. And that's a bunch of lies. You know, kid, don't worry. I know, I know Moses has been lucky on a couple of these, you know, but, but, you, but you're not going to die. You know, and the kid can believe he's going to die. And he goes to bed and he sleeps like a baby. He's going to wake up alive. His belief didn't have anything to do with it. What counted was whether or not his father put blood on the doorpost and the lentils. That's what mattered. You know, the kid, kid might say to his father, you know, I, I'm going to die. And, and his father, no, you're not. No, you're not. I put blood on the doorpost and the, and the lentils. And, and the kid thinks, well, you know, that's, a, that's a bunch of foolishness. What's the blood going to do, Dad? I, you know, well, don't worry about it, son. You're not going to die. I put, I put blood on the doorpost and the lentils. I, don't, you're not going to die. Now, he can go to bed. Kid can go to bed. He can bite his fingernails and his toenails all night long. Be scared to death. But he's going to wake up alive. Doesn't matter what he believes. 
It does not matter what the kid believes. It doesn't matter what he receives, what is supremely important. <laughs> Dearly beloved, what is of enormous importance is did his father apply the blood? He didn't apply the blood. He didn't make the sacrifice. Nicodemus should have known that. Nicodemus should have seen in the lamb that the innocent lamb died for the guilty. What, what was so strange? What was strange about telling Nicodemus that he needed to be born from above? Oh, see, Steve, Nick, Jesus told Nicodemus, you got, we, you got to be born again. You must be born again. I've heard that a thousand times. So we got we to gotta be born again. We got to do something. It, it, it's the must of necessity, not obligation. Of course you must be born from above. It doesn't, it's not saying you have to do something to be born from above. In Habakkuk, it's the righteous man shall live by the faithfulness of God. Nicodemus should have known that, and we should know it more than Nicodemus. We should know that we are redeemed because, because Jesus Christ paid the price, period. That's it, okay? We did nothing, and we live, we live, we walk. We don't always walk, but we live, says the text, in the sphere of grace. Do you have any idea how great the effort is in the Christian community to not live in grace? Man, I, it boggles my mind. I, I think it's wonderful. Oh, for you to know the peace, the rest, and the joy that's yours in Christ, to be able not to worry about anything but with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will guard, keep, the word is guard, your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what you want? How many people I talk to who have no peace, no rest? Oh, Steve, you don't know what I did. You don't know how I live, how sinful I am. Believe me, dearly beloved, I don't want to know. Actually, maybe you'd be better off telling me because you know what? I think you're pretty rotten. I'll just say it. But so am I. Aren't you getting this? I, you may be, I, that's the way I see you in the flesh, but I know you're redeemed by the death of Jesus Christ in your place. He paid the price. You didn't. He did. You didn't, you didn't do that. You died with Him. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. People have told me over the years, oh, Steve, I've, oh, I have tried, I've tried, I've tried. I've tried to do that. I really tried to crucify the flesh, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't, and, or I can't, you know. Well, of course you couldn't. First of all, it's already crucified. It's pretty hard to kill something. You know, you know what? It's pretty hard to kill something that's already dead. I, you know, I tried that once with a possum, you know, that was playing dead. Well, that's another story. Dearly beloved, you died with Christ. You were buried with Christ and you rose with Christ. If the flesh isn't crucified, you're not Christ. You don't belong to Him. And then we got down to verse 25. You know, this, this has all been an introduction so far. And I'm about the end of the video. I apologize for that, but dearly beloved, you need, we need to put ourselves in remind, remind ourselves of these things. Since we live in the Spirit, since we live in the Spirit, well, I pointed out that it's a first class condition. Since we live in the Spirit, present tense, 
We are constantly living in the Spirit. I'm going to stop at the beginning of that expression. You're not living in the Spirit sometimes. Well, Steve, sometimes I live in the Spirit, sometimes I don't. No. <laughs> Folks, you're not living in the Spirit sometimes and not in the other. Your translation may have by the Spirit. I, I, I can't argue with that. It, it's in various translations say different things. By, of, in, what. But I pointed out to you that in the lack of any other evidence, if it's a passive verb, it's normally translated. Normally, it's translated as the dative of instrument or means. If it's an active verb, well, then it's normally translated in the dative of, the, of sphere. And, and this is a present active. We live in the sphere of the Spirit. That's, that's where you live. That's where you live. That's where I live. It's where we all live. That's where you always live. You don't live anywhere else. And it, it is a present tense. You're not moving in and out of that sphere. That's the point I tried to make as, as we began to look at verse 19. You are constantly in the sphere of the Spirit. Okay? Now the first class condition goes on. Let us also walk in the Spirit. If you remember in verse 16, we were told with the present imperative, the mood of command, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill, that complete, the lust of the flesh. The word walk, there is a normal word for walk, peripateo in the Greek. I've suggested in, in in many a study years ago that it is the word from which we get the word parapet. God has guarded our walk. Folks, He gave you the walk that you have. Of course, He, of course he guards it. And you ought to rejoice in it. And we're told to walk. We're told to walk. And I said, I believe it's in the Spirit. Now most, I say most, of the modern translations have by the Spirit, it's a, it is a present active imperative. So again, I translated it as the sphere of the Spirit rather than the, the instrument of the, of the Spirit. If we walk in that sphere, we will not fulfill... Complete the lusts of the flesh. And now we get down to verse 25. We're living in that sphere and there's no doubt about it. That's where you live. If you want to live somewhere else, sorry. But that's where you live. The first class condition goes on then and says, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us walk in the Spirit. The word walk here, here is stoikeko or stoicheo. Some have suggested it means walk in agreement with the Spirit. Walk in agreement with the Spirit. I think the root meaning of the word is to walk in line or in step with you know, it's, it's some, the word is sometimes used in the military context to walk in step with or to, you know, or to walk in line with. You, know, you, you guys have been in the military. You, un, you know what I'm talking about. And I believe that means walking by the Word of God. Now you can say this is not, well, this is not an inerrant Bible. You know, it's not an infallible book. It's not an infall the infallible Word of God. It simply contains the Word of God. I, I, I've heard that so many times. And, and my heart aches for people so deluded. This, folks, is God's Word. And it is not open to question. It is God's Word. 
I believe walking in line with the Spirit is walking in line with, big surprise, the Word of God. Dearly beloved, don't, don't say you believe something because you heard it from me. Please don't do that. Your, your reason for belief, your reason for walking in line with the Spirit is to know the line the Spirit walks. To know this book, to know the Word of God, to spend time in it. It's the most precious possession you could possibly own in this life. I don't think you walk by emotion. Not, well, I'm going to say I'm sure you don't walk by emotion. Emotions come and go, folks. Emotions can be, can be all over the place, can be faked, but the Word of God cannot be faked. Since we live in the Spirit, since we live in the sphere of the Spirit, let's walk in line with the Spirit. That, that means, that means, Studying to show yourselves approved workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means giving yourself diligently to the word of God. And that isn't going to be, well, that isn't going to, that's, that's not going to some Christian bookstore and buying everything on the shelf. Okay, it's, it is working hard studying the Word of God. People have, uh, people have said to me, well, I, Steve, I don't enjoy studying the Bible. It's confusing uh, to me and it's dry. The scriptures are not near as dry as a textbook manual on a computer. I don't really understand that kind of thinking. I signed up for this uh, course in Bible college and they, uh, well, they recommended a, a reference book. And so I, I went to a bookstore and uh, I bought it, bought the book. I couldn't understand the preface. You know, and I thought, you know, what have I done? I don't even, I don't even understand the, the preface. What am I going to do, you know, when I, I get into this book? You know, be nice if, uh, you know, I could just, take this Bible of mine, and I guess, and just put it under my pillow, and when I wake up in the morning, well, I, you know, I just know all about it. You know, all that would just automatically sort of seep into my head. Folks, why shouldn't it be hard to study the Word of God? Study to show yourselves approved. Give diligence to the Word of God. It, it isn't easy. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. But, it, but so it, isn't, that, isn't that true of everything else? Anything else? Everything I've ever done that was worthwhile, folks, is a lot of work. I don't know of anything greater than digging truth out of this book and, and having it speak volumes to my heart. It isn't easy. And I believe that walking in line with the Spirit is giving diligence to the Word of God because there's where the trouble lies. That seems lacking in much of modern Christianity today. Let us not become, we're about to finish this chapter finally. Let us not become desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. How would we do that, folks? How would we do that? Let us not. It's a, it's a passive voice. Let us not become desirous or be made desirous of empty glory, provoking one another and envying 
one another. The only way, folks, that we could do that is to fall from grace back to law. Fall under law. And believe me, it happens. It happens. I want you to know that I do, I, do, I do not. I don't have any grand idea that everything said from this pulpit, this ministry, this channel is truth. I do know everything in this book is true. I, I do know that. I am persuaded the only way we could envy one another and the only way that we could provoke one another is by law. By law. Happens every moment of every day. Somewhere. Keep in mind the context of the chapter. The Holy Spirit hasn't moved away from the terrible conflict, the terrible difference, the great chasm that exists between law and grace. That's been the, the dominant theme of the book. And it's going to be important when we begin the next chapter. Okay, because there isn't any chapter division. There, I mean, in the original manuscripts, there's no chapter division. Vain glory. Empty glory. Provoking, envying. Is based on the human merit system. You can't do that in grace. You can't do that. You are what you are by the grace of God. You are what you are because of the grace of God. I walk with a God of eternity who holds me in the hollow of His hand and He works all things together for my good. I trust that that's your experience, too. If these five chapters have taught us anything, it's that there is a Christless Christianity. What is modern Christianity? Well, well, it's help the poor and the needy. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, go out and do good. Uh, win many souls for, for the Lord. Doesn't really matter whether Christ ever lived or died. You know, that's, that's not important. Uh, doesn't really matter what He's done. It's all What really matters is what you, you need to do. Folks, that's why it's been called a noble lie. And boy, did it work. That lie has changed society. It has led people to help the needy and to assist the poor and to help those in difficult circumstances, all based on a lie. That's the theology of the modern mind, I guess. You know, in Amos, we read that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but a thirst for hearing my words, saith the Lord. I study church history. I think it's fascinating stuff. It's, it's, your, it's your spiritual family genealogy. If Pelagius were alive today, I think he would he'd conclude that, that he won. Even though every church council, you know, some of them, in, including 1,500 theologians, at least, or more, and Bible scholars, Branded him a heretic. It's difficult to find anyone that isn't preaching today an Arminian gospel. You know, something that you must do. I know uh, many pastors believe that you're, you're redeemed by grace and by grace alone. 
But in order to be sanctified, well, you must do this, that, and the other thing, whatever. And so the almighty, eternal, sovereign God who loves you with an everlasting love, who calls you His children, leaves it up to you to sanctify yourself. Folks, you haven't got a chance. You were made absolutely righteous in Christ. Just as you were made a sinner in Adam, you were made absolutely righteous in Christ. That, that is a fact. You had no choice in being made a sinner in Adam. You had no choice in being made righteous in Christ. None whatsoever. And yet, human choice... Well, is basically is the bedrock. It's the foundation of modern so-called evangelical Christianity today. And I think that's sad. You died with Christ. You were made alive. And because you're made alive, because you are His sheep, you can believe. You can believe. John chapter 10. Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would hear my voice. And you would follow me. So accepting Christ and hearing His voice is based entirely, entirely upon your sheephood. I guess that's a word. I don't know. Uh, in modern evangelical preaching, it makes your sheephood based upon you. Folks, if that's true, you haven't got a chance. Praise God, it's by grace. The only way that you could be desirous of vain glory. I want you to know as we leave this chapter, the only way that you could be desirous of vain glory, the only way that you could envy one another is you, you, one who is made absolutely righteous in Christ, walk in the sphere of the flesh rather than in the sphere of the Spirit. Okay? Listen, just because just because you kick around in garbage does not mean that you're garbage. You are made the righteousness of God in Him. And folks, that is not tarnished by your walk. But boy, do you pay a price in fellowship and then communion in peace and rest and joy. What a wonderful, wonderful peace to know that you're at peace with God. That God has nothing against you. Nothing. If you think He does, it's all in your mind. He doesn't. That's what we see in the good news. God says, I have nothing against you. Okay? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we stand again in Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege that we have to feast together upon Your Word. We recognize that we are scaling the very walls of infinity and we ask that the Holy Spirit be our teacher, that He would filter out the foolishness and the error but open our hearts to truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.